when I was growing up on the Gulf Coast, we had a Frank Brown International Songwriters Festival at the Floribama. That was our, our link to Nashville. And so my dad would take me out that we knew the owner of the club. My aunt was the book, uh, the accountant for the floor of Mammoth. So we got, my dad would take me to that club uh, when I was a little kid. And I'd sit in with the blues bands and the songwriters. And that was Hank Cochran, Red Lane, Mickey Newberry, uh, you know, Chuck Cannon, Gove Scrivener, Larry John Wilson, all these guys that, that, that were, you know, I didn't even understand at that age the importance and the magnitude of the guys that I was sitting in the room with. <clears throat> at seven o'clock in the morning after we'd been up all night, I was probably 12 years old or 13 playing the mandolin with these guys. We were hanging out at Pirates Cove one night and I was a kid and uh, we jumped in a boat. We heard there was a party going on on Bear Point, which was about a 15 minute boat ride across the channel, the intercoastal waterway. And there was this house that was on the end of the Bear Point that we all marveled at every time we would drive past in a boat. You know, we, my family, we didn't have any money, but they all built wooden boats, you know? And so, uh, we were we were driving past there, and we always marveled at this amazing architecture of this house on, at the end of Bear Point. And uh, as you're going through the channel that goes to the Gulf of Mexico, it's right there. And so uh, we we got a rumor about this New Year's Eve party on, and we're all on the deck at Pirates Cove, and we all jumped in this boat and uh, with our instruments, and we went to this party. Well, it was at that house on the end of the of the point. This amazing house, you know. And so we go in, and and uh, and there's a guy sitting in the middle of the of the of the floor, you know, playing his ass off and singing all these songs. Well, that was Gove Scrivener, right? And so we started playing, and from that night forward, we had a a run of probably five or six years of playing together. We did the sailing Olympics in Savannah. We opened up for uh, uh, got to meet and hang out with uh, um, uh, Richie Havens one night down in South Alabama. We opened up for him and had a long talk. Him and Gove had known each other. And um, and we got to do a bunch of cool shit. Well, we had this duo, and, and Gove played these high energy. He could play anything from the most beautiful kind of bluegrass and folk-inspired instrumentals to these beautiful, beautiful songs that he wrote that had great lyrics. Uh, had some commercial success in Nashville by with Hank Williams Jr. cutting a few songs and different artists. And... and um, and then could do Delta Delta Blues. He was, in, you know, knew Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee really well and the folk scene and was in with all that really cool stuff that we all know and love so well from the 60s and 70s. And so obviously this guy's a lot older than I am, um, as most of my friends are that we were talking about earlier. You know, you know I, I always say you don't get to be that cool until you're that old. And so that, what, you know, um, and so... What happened was, as me and Gove played this duo, he would play acoustic guitar and auto harp. I'd play mandolin and acoustic guitar. And then later on, maybe some electric. But it was a really cool thing that I got to do uh, down there. And, that, and the connection was that Frank Brown International Songwriters Festival. That was our thread to Nashville. If I was in Panama City or, or you know, some other spot on the Gulf Coast, it might not have had that, that direct uh, vein to Nashville. I mean... And as we know now, musicians and songwriters, as we just, me and Otis have, have, have we, we crossed at like two ships in the night going to Key West. <laughs> he was there the week before and I was there the next week. And as you know, if you give an artist or a musician a good destination, it, it helps a lot. <laughs> so all these guys loved coming down to the floor of Bama. The bar's right on the Gulf of Mexico. They'd come down and drink for, you know, 10 days and play their songs every night. It was amazing. And so... Um, Fast forward to Gove now is bringing me to Nashville and getting to hang out at Brown's Diner and with Cowboy Jack Clement in his office and doing the cat tricks and hearing stories and meeting Ferg, uh, David Ferguson, who I still work with today, and and getting to know about guys like Pat McLaughlin. And, and of course, I'm John Bryan and Bob Dylan and a lot of the Nashville songwriters have been household names in my uh, the house that I grew up in, which is the Geodome, which eventually we'll probably get to, maybe not on this episode, but... It's a hell of a story, and uh, the way I was brought up, which I, I you know, wouldn't change for the world, uh, but got to know kind of the, the, kind of like the, I call it like the root system of Nashville, like the old guard, the old, and I say old, these guys, a lot of these guys are still around, you know, um, Mark Howard, Pat McLaughlin, uh, David Ferguson, uh, God, who's the producer that did all the great Trisha Yearwood stuff? Garth Fundus, who I met on the Gulf Coast as well. So came to Nashville, 
uh, stayed with Pat McInerney and Leanne at their house. And, and again, this is like the, I'm probably like 16 or 17 years old. And we're riding around Nashville and Gove's little Mazda pickup truck. And we're going to Brown's Diner. And I'm drinking beer at Brown's Diner at 2 o'clock in the afternoon with Gove and all these songwriters. And I'm not even near old enough to be in there on or off the record. But we'd go in there and I could, I, well, nobody was carding me back then because I was hanging out with Gove who was 30 years older than me, you know? And so that was my introduction to Nashville way before it was even an option to, on the radar to move here. And so, but at that point we, were, we recorded a couple records. We went to Mark Howard's house on 12 South that I ended up living at eight, for eight years after I moved here, which is a whole other story. But Mark had a, a studio in his house, and me and Gove went and uh, cut a couple songs over there. Well, then we came back another trip and did a full-blown record where we got to work with Nancy Griffith and uh, and Prine and Emmy Lou Harris and a, and a bunch of other cast of characters uh, that were on this record. And I played mandolin and some acoustic guitar on it, and I was definitely the uh, the kid in the room, you know, that didn't know shit. But I was with Gove, and we'd played all these songs, and I knew the songs, and and we went and got to record, you know, with these with these with these guys. And I remember there's a great photo of me and Gove and John Bryan at Mark's studio, you know, and and uh, he was always great. And then I'd see him around town at Melrose Billiards, and uh, and I'd see him with uh, with Ferg at different events and stuff like that. And I didn't know John well, but we knew each other well enough to where he'd say hi Guthrie, and I'd say hi John, and we'd talk for a minute. And you just want to be as as cool and as as, as you know, respectful as possible. Another really great thing about Nashville that um, that some of you guys know about were the great, great, great parties that uh, Jim McGuire would have over at his photography studio, which was also his house that he lived in on 8th Avenue. And he sold that a couple years ago. And um, I think Trish Shearer would actually bought that to do a cooking show or something. I don't know what happened with that. But, but Senior McGuire, and I got to call him so bad because he is one of my favorite characters on the planet. And you know him because he did all these, uh, you've seen his work. Uh, he did all the great black and white photos that are all over Nashville and they're just legendary. They all had the same canvas gray background. Background. Backdrop of uh, Towns, Guy Clark, John Hartford, Bill Monroe, mm -hmm. you name it. You name it. And his stuff, I mean, I'm, it, I'm blown away still. Like I'll go to certain bars or restaurants in Nashville that you wouldn't even think, and that there's like a whole wall of his work. You know, it's, he's just a total legend and a fucking awesome human being. And he would have these great parties in his photography studio. Well, it's like we were talking about earlier. We come in here and it's like, what do artists want? They just want a lot of space. <laughs> and so when you're trying to buy a house and you realize people buy houses that have that are that are made for your normal American family where there's three bedrooms and a dining room. And I go, man, can we just knock all these walls out <laughs> and have an open space to have a, a pool table or a drum kit or a, or a bunch of cameras, you know? 30 guitars. A bunch of guitars, <laughs> right? A bunch of amps. And so Jim did it, and he was our hero because he, he bought an old grocery store on 8th Avenue back in the 70s or 80s for probably 20 grand. Uh, and he, he gutted it, and that was his photography studio. And he would have these amazing picky, picking parties. He had a pool table. He'd park his his Woody car that he was so famous for and the dog. And uh, he'd have a bar set up in there. And it was just, it's the way that any creative person wanted to live. And he did it. He had the uh, Hunter S. Thompson uh, Memorial gun range in the kitchen where they'd fire 22s <laughs> into the back <laughs> in his house because he had the block wall at the back. And so they just, they treated it to where he could sit it at the kitchen and in target practice in the inside the house. <laughs> and so I was like, who's not gonna who doesn't love this guy immediately? But he's a renaissance man. I mean, you know, and so that was another just a great way to mingle with all the what I consider the root system, the old school kind of uh the guys that that were like the 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 cool cats back in the day, like the Jack Clement kind of crowd, you know. So people know that McGuire's there are photos he's taken of people that a lot of uh, other photographers have taken, but there are particular photos that are, I think, the photo of that artist. There's a Bill Monroe photo that is like the photo I think of a Bill Monroe. There's a John Hartford one with him with his banjo. Yeah. A little younger. Guy and Susanna. Guy and Susanna. That's exactly. Yeah, there's photos like that when you can't imagine these people um, in another situation. In right. Photo. 
And and you know what? Um, the one of um, the one of Guy holding Verlin and Sean by the <laughs> collar, shirt collars. And if you don't know who Verlin Thompson is, man, that's a whole other person that nobody in Nashville, you know, all these young all these young kids don't know who he is, you know. But um, he's a guy to check out. But you know, I've, this photographer told me a long time ago. He said, if you shoot in color which I love color and black and white. I'm just a huge fan of all of it, but any good, great art. Uh, but he goes, if you shoot in color, you're just taking a, a picture of somebody's clothes or what they're wearing. He goes, if you shoot in black and white, you're just getting the the vibe or whatever, right? But I kind of I kind of uh, agree with that a little bit. I mean, if somebody's if you're sitting with two people, and I think that's why musicians wear black black and gray all the time. Because it's it's not that we're like dark and, and we're depressed all the time. It's that we know it looks good on camera. <laughs> <laughs> we need all the help we can get. It's like you ever seen you ever seen Johnny Cash and Bob Dylan and all those guys? I mean, they all wore black suits because they knew that I mean, hey man, if anybody ever takes a photo or you're doing something on TV, black and let the guitar be the the centerpiece, you know. Anyway, I mean, that's all subjective, of course, like everything in this world. But anyway, I know we're getting off the subject, yeah. but.